We are living in the greatest period in human history. A period of massive technological and economic advancement. Never in our history have we been so close to a world where we can live truly free and independent lives. But here's the thing. There are those with money, power, and influence who would rather see you dependent on them and the system they created. A system designed to keep you comfortable, apathetic, and distracted. We believe the road to true independence doesn't come through political elections or senseless regulation, but rather in maximizing the empowerment of the individual. If you feel the same way, then get ready. My name's Jason Stapleton. Welcome to Wealth, Power, and Influence. Oh, all right, boys and girls, welcome back. So glad that you are here. It is Monday, and uh, yeah, I'm not here. I am out of town, which is why we don't have a video version of the show and why you are relegated to listening to the podcast in audio form. But uh, we still have a very exciting show for you today. I'm actually I'm actually practicing what I preach. I decided to take a little bit of time off, head out of town. My fiance has all of her family in town, and so I have been quarantined this week in preparation for said event and uh, I'm probably drunk by now. But I do want to uh, tell you about a couple of things before we get started. Today is the last day that you can sign up for the Podcasting Domination Program and save 40%. If you want to know all about it, I'm not going to get into it. I've been talking about it for two or three days. Just go to Jason's Podcast Offer. Dot com. It'll be in the show notes as well. You can go there and check it out. Uh, we got a whole bunch of new people who've come in and we're we'll spending the next oh, four to six weeks working on doing uh, what I do best, which is talking in the typing. So I'm going to be teaching you guys uh, pretty much everything I know about podcasting and trying to help you uh, grow a show and start generating a little bit of revenue with that as well. And so uh, go check that out. It's uh, Jason's podcast offer.com. Now I got a very special guest for you today. Now, this guy was recommended, as you guys know, I don't do many guests on this show. I, I like to hear the sound of my own voice, and so I am concerned primarily with my own opinions. But I did get an email from Mark Clare. You guys know him over at Lions of Liberty, and he said, Hey, man, I know you don't have any guests on your show, um, but you should really take a look at this guy because he's doing a lot of cool stuff, and it, it's, it really dovetails well with what you've been talking about with the nomadic wealth and, and all of that. And so... Uh, I said, all right, send his stuff over and keep in mind, I've known Mark for probably five years now. He's never asked me and said, I need to look at somebody to have on my show. So, um, I gave it due consideration and it turns out this guy is doing some pretty incredible stuff and he's got a really interesting perspective on freedom and the, and what we all think of in free as freedom. And so his name is Gary Collins. He is the host of the, your better life podcast. He's written several books. I'm jealous. Uh, the most recent one is called the simple life guide to small habits for big change, 14 powerful lessons for living a life of success and integrity. Well, that's a mouthful, Gary, what's going on, man. And I came up with that all on my own. <laughs> I tend to forget the subtitle. People go, Oh, your book. And I, I, I space it and I go, golly, after you've written so many too, they'll go, Hey, you remember what you put in this book? And you're all, no, yeah. no, I don't. Uh, I remember most of it because it is my stuff. Yeah. Which is unusual in the self help world. And I even hate that term, but there's no other place to put me until I uh, create my own. Which yeah. I'm working on. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about. So do you have a background as a, in in uh, in English? Are you or were you a writer? Uh, and have you always been a writer? You have a background in marketing. Talk to me a little bit about your background. I have a background in none of those. I am a red dumb redneck from the middle of nowhere who grew up in a single wide trailer. I do very highbrow items like today. I had to go to the dump. You know, mm -hmm. that's, uh, and it brought back memories. Me and my family, we used to dig trash in the dump for entertainment. I forgot about that. That hit me today. I went, God, we used to go to the dump and dig around in there. Oh my Lord. Yeah. We used How to hunt rats at the, we used to hunt rats at the dump. I had a double wide trailer I grew up in. So I beat you. I was fancy. Yeah. You, you went big time. We, mm -hmm. we couldn't quite, well, we had additions. <laughs> my <laughs> was the enclosed area of the high end white trash deck okay. and I my butt off every winter. I could see my breath in the morning. I wrote about this in one of my in that book, and talked about the leaky roof and yeah. The, it, but you know, it, it builds character. But yeah, I I was a math guy. I went to school and was good in math. 
and I went started college as an engineering major. Soon realized I was a dummy and couldn't work and afford college and you know major in engineering at the same time. So yeah, I have my background in writing would be criminal investigative investigative reports. I was a special agent for oh gosh, 11 12 years and uh military intelligence. I was a cryptologist. I was a spook enlisted mm. and then an intelligence officer. I'm a Mustang. And uh, yeah, that was my career path for half my life. I was now. When you say when you say Mustang for for everybody who does an abla, that means he was an enlisted guy and then became an officer. So they call those guys Mustangs. Yeah, yeah. There's there are not a whole lot of us. I didn't know that when I did that. No, um, I had I had one captain when I wore, when I was with Fifth Force Recon. Um, I had one captain, Captain Whitnam, who was an enlisted guy who who went and became an officer, and he was by far my my favorite CO. He was just he just he got he got shit. So it was nice. Well, yeah, and you know what it was. People understood that I'd clean toilets too. Mm. And, and, you know, when you're trying to get the troops rallied and get them, get them together and get them to do the things you want, it, when you speak from a perspective of you've never done it, kind of doesn't, doesn't ring true. You know, they kind of ignore you. Mm -hmm. But not only that, but I, I started cleaning toilets well before I was in the military. So I didn't even have to learn. To, I was really good at cleaning toilets by the time I got to it, got to the military. Just like today, I tell people I can dig a hole. I dig all my own holes on my property because I'm really good at it because <laughs> I yeah. had to do it growing up. I worked on ranches. You know, you grew up poor. You, you dig holes. You clean restrooms. Uh, you clean plates, dishes, mow lawns. I was a maid at the local hotel. I did whatever. Well, it's you funny. Know, you get, yeah. I was that's why say, I think we resonated so well. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, it's funny you say that because when I got out of the Marines, I was just like, I was probably, I was probably six or eight percent body fat and I, I was just a, a just a, just a ball of like very lean muscular frame, right? My six foot two frame. And I, I, the first job I got was working for my buddy, Ben Atchison, who w w owned a small landscaping company. And my job was really to dig holes and plant trees. And I was amazed. He called it redneck strength, but that dude w <laughs> at certain things, he couldn't do a pull up. Uh, he'd probably do five push-ups, but he could dig holes like it was nobody's business. And I would, I'd be exhausted and he'd just be digging away. And so I, I, it's a, it, I, I know exactly what you're talking about when you say, I know how to dig holes and I know how to do that sort of stuff. Cause that's just stuff. If you're, if you're a good old boy that you just kind of, that's just part of your life. Well, and I just did it. I mean, I recently mixed 60 bags plus of concrete by hand in my wheelbarrow for my wind turbine which I made the stanchion all myself. And, you know, I dug, dug all the holes and everyone's all, you do all that? And I go, yeah, no one's coming up to the top of the mountain coming up here to do this for me. And if they do, they're probably going to screw it up. I'm going to have to yell at them and fire them and do it again anyway. Right. So I, yeah, growing up poor, you, you learn a lot. You know, there's a lot more self-reliance and, and growing up in the middle of nowhere like I did. And you, you grew up in, was it Kansas? Oh, yeah, Kansas. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in a little place called Lone Pine. I'm sure you've heard of in California on the way to Mammoth. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I had to look it up. I actually looked it up when you when you uh, you were talking about it, and uh, yeah, it's it's in. Well, you got it was kind of in the mountains, though, right? You're up in the hills. It's really pretty country up there. Well, no, that's where I went to school. Oh, I grew up in Olancha. <laughs> Olancha was the little crappy place you went through about 25 miles outside, heading towards L.A. Uh, that had a used to have a teepee back in the day, uh, a concrete. Uh, teepee out in front of it. That was a lancha. I lived up the top of the road in the trailer, whole monks trailers. About fifty, well, fifty to a hundred people lived in that town. Uh -huh. So yeah, yeah. When I say I grew up rural, I grew up rural. Well, let's I mean, talk. I, let's know. talk a little bit about um, kind of because you you talked about self reliance a little bit earlier, and that's that's kind of your thing. When we first talked, to, you and I got on the phone to chat about you coming on the show, one of the things you said was, you know, you're, you're off talk about a lot about off the grid living. And I said, ah, you know what? I just, that's, I get that. And, and I always have been one who has food stores and has weapons and stuff like that. I've, I've always been prepared, but I don't want to live in the middle of nowhere with an outhouse, you know, and, and electricity that's run off a generator. And, uh, and you said, no, 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 that's, that's not really what I'm, what I'm talking about is I'm not, you're, you said, I'm not talking about being that detached 
from society. Um, and I think that that's important. I want you to talk a little bit about that because when you talk about self-reliance and I talk about it in terms of controlling the source of your income and in really having the, the, the wealth and the mobility to go and do and be free, um, you deal with another aspect of that. So talk to me a little bit about your philosophy, if you can boil it down to a, you know, a couple of concepts. Yeah, and it, I want to make it clear too. Is there's a division in what I do a little bit. I have the Off the Grid book series, which there's three books in there. Going Off the Grid is my claim to fame. That's been a bestseller on Amazon for a couple of years now. But then I have the Simple Life series, which is more geared towards everyone. Every, I shouldn't say everyone. You never want to do that right in a business. But it, it's geared towards the everyday American, you know, struggling with all the things we struggle with today. But the Off the Grid stuff, I call it one foot in, one foot out. Because I run a business, you know, um, if you walked in my house, no one would ever know it's off the grid. It's not a mansion. It's not huge. It's a roughly less than a thousand square feet, small footprint, 14 inch walls, but it's very, you know, it's got all the appliances I had in my house in San Diego. No different. Matter of fact, I have the same stove I had in my house in San Diego, exact same stove. So I like to, I tell people, why do I want to suffer if I don't have to? What's the point? I want to poop in a bucket. That's not what I'm looking for. I call that camping. You know, I've done plenty of that. I don't want to live that way. So I think people look at my lifestyle and they go, you know what? I can do that. And for me, it's just returning to my roots of the way I grew up. Sure. You know, quiet. Where I, you know, you, at the time when you're growing up, you're being poor, you go, this sucks, right? I can't believe this. You know, I live out in the middle of nowhere. There's no girls around. And if they are, well, you know, I got to travel a mile, uh, you know, and all that. And then you get older and you realize, well, wow, you know what? That wasn't all that bad. I had a lot of freedom. You know, my parents didn't know where I was at any given time for the most part. I was all over the place, uh, you know. And with that, that developed this philosophy later on through everything outside of going off the grid. And what happened is that was a transition book. I was a health guy. I started a health company once I got out of the government, Primal Paleo Health, Ancestral Health. I was working with high-end athletes, mainly football players, offensive linemen of all thing, things. I'm 5'6", about 140. <laughs> but I played football. Well, how, and, uh, how, how do you – hang on. How do you transition? I'm always interested in this because how, how do you transition from that? You were – you started out as a math guy. You ended up going and working for the FBI as a special agent. You were all, you also worked as an in intelligence in the military. And then you get out and all of a sudden now you're a health expert working with pro athletes. Like how do you how do you make those jumps like that? Well, it was a pro athlete. So the guy – I was working with a former all-pro Green Bay Packer. And okay. he was uh, – he had kids that he was grooming and they wanted help into getting into major colleges to play football. Well, I, I tell people, you know, I have that, uh, I'm going to use a term where he can't use anybody, but retard strength. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a little guy, but I was strong and I always have been. And, you know, that's because I work hard and I, I know strength and conditioning. If there's anything in this world which shocks people that I know, it's health. That's kind of... I, I've been in it for over four decades between organized sports. And at the end, I worked for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the FDA is a special agent. So I have all the inside not nasty. I don't even know. I tell people, I don't even know. I don't just know how the sausage was made. I was the sausage. Mm. I mean, if everyone, you know how it is. If, if people really knew what goes on, boy, they would be even more pissed than they really are. <laughs> But, you know, so with that, I, I was always a health junkie and, and I'd done everything wrong. I was following what I was told. I was close to 40, felt like crap. You know, things were, the wheels were falling off and working for the FDA taught me, ah, I'd been doing everything wrong. I'd been doing what I was taught to do, which was completely the opposite. Flip the food pyramid upside down, go back to logic, and that's really health. And so what I did is I was teaching clients that. But I just ran into this guy randomly at a street fair, this all pro Green Bay Packer, and we started talking. And next thing I know, we're in a business meeting and he, he funnels me a kid and he goes, dang, you really know what you're doing. And I just kind of evolved. And I was known in the survivalist community, a guy you know, um, uh, Jack Spurko. And, yeah. and they, they, he found an article I wrote. I, I basically went after a natural health uh, charlatan, I'll call her. And uh, I was the only guy who did it. Every, everyone else was afraid of her. And I went, absolutely not. I went, I'm not going to back down. Mm -hmm. uh, she's full of it. And come to find out, it was all staged. But to generate, you know, buzz and all that, you know, typical stuff people do. But he liked it. And I ended up being kind of a darling in the primal, primal health side to preppers and survivalists. Wow, that's I great. I wasn't one. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I just ended up in those communities. And so that's how the whole health business kind of came. And then uh, I was doing an interview for his show. He had me on. And he goes, what, at the very end of all this health talk, he goes, what are you up to? And I go, well, I just bought 20 acres. And I'm going to build a house off the grid in Northeast Washington. He goes, wait, time out. Hold on. <laughs> interview goes, he, we were going to stop reboots. And I got a ton of emails on it. And I went, oh, I guess I have my next book idea. And that's where this whole thing spawned out of was just me living my life and sharing it accidentally and then that evolved into the simple life eventually because what i was teaching was life simplification yeah i know and all- that's that's interesting i don't mean to interrupt you but just take me through take me through the thought process for you as as you're beginning to to think about move uh, simplifying your life what does that mean to simplify your life and what drove you to move from uh, wherever it was in uh, in in San Diego to sell your stuff and and move into the middle of nowhere is it was it did you have a a midlife crisis? Did you, would you just, did you come to a realization, um, on, as you headed into the back half of life that you just wanted something different? What caused the transition? Well, I blame the government, uh, the federal government. I was burned out. I had spent literally half my life in it at that point. And I was just done. There was nothing left. And I had a, a parting conversation with my, uh, special agent charge sack. And I told him, and it didn't go over well, then I go, I can't tell the difference between the people I work for and the criminals anymore. And he looked at me like, you know, <laughs> wow. if he could have killed me right there, he would have done it. And I went, no, I'm being serious. I went, I'm leaving to save my soul. I, I got to get out of here. And at that point, it was, you know, I was just very disenchanted with the system mm-hmm. in general. But I, I was also fighting really bad depression. I'd had a couple panic attacks. And anyone's had a panic attack, which I'd never had until then, you literally think you're dying. The last, the first one I had, I thought I was dying. I thought I was having a full on heart attack. And it kind of made me realize this isn't worth it. I, I'm done chasing the carrot. You know, I can chase a carrot and die an early, early death, or I can get out of this and, and turn my life around and live my life on my own terms. And that's where I was. I was always kind of a free, freewheeler thinker, even in the government, but I was really good at my job. So they gave me a lot of leeway, even though I pissed them off most of the time. It was more of just let him go. And, uh, you know, I just, I tell people, my first vote was for Ross Perot, for God's sakes. Mm-hmm. I've always been that guy. I had a libertarian mindset before it was even cool. And that's, and like Matt Kibbe, we're big Rush fans. Me and him are big geeks on that. You, and, you that and Matt be- Kibbe. Dude, I, I love Matt Kibbe. God, every time I meet that guy, he's just, he's He's super chill, incredibly intelligent, and he's into all this like weird stuff, like this this terrible like micro brews that he brought out, and and he just he loves this stuff. He dresses like a like a hipster, um, but he wears it well, covered in tattoos, and can hold a conversation with you um, in depth on pretty much anything. I'm I'm just he's an impressive human being, and uh, yeah, he's a guy that he's a guy you want to be around. Yeah, and we, you know, we've we've kind of come, we ran in similar circles for years too, and we finally were introduced and hit it off right away. And like I said, we're big rush geeks, and it all start with that. And you got to turn off your notifications, Gary. Always got to do that. Jeez, Louise. Um, so yeah, it, it evolved into. I had a plan, a little bit of a plan, you know. So I sold my house, short sold my house, lost about a quarter of a million dollars cash on my house in San Diego. Brutal. God, feels, it was you know that's big terrible. Part- yeah. And, but I, I said, it's worth it. At that yeah. point, I said, I've got to just, I've got to move on. Either I let this house rule my life or I take control. So I sold almost all my belongings on Craigslist in about 48 hours. People were coming up with trailers because everyone was telling their friends, this dude's having a fire sale. Mm-hmm. You know, I sold my, I sold my ceiling fans, my blinds. I said, whatever doesn't need to stay, make an offer. <laughs> just not the dogs. I'm taking the dogs. Everything else can go. And, uh, made about 10 grand and basically just took everything, moved into a 475 square foot studio or a uh, kind of, it was a small home. It's a cottage is the, the definition of it, but out a little further outside of San Diego and spent four years there, eventually moved into my RV travel trailer, little one too, and just kind of evolved, went through this whole life cycle of simplification, kind of getting back to what's important. And that's where all this stuff evolved from. I kept doing, you know, podcast interviews. That's what I've 
built the business on. Mm -hmm. I didn't have my podcast till it's almost been a year now. But well, I, when, I always when you just, say when you say get back yeah. to what's important, what what do you mean for you? What is that? What is that for you? What what's the important things about life and and living? You know, for me, it was just a simpler life. I was sick of all the noise, you know. And when we grew up, when I grew up. I, there wasn't twenty four hour news. That was a new. That's a newer mm -hmm. thing. And social media. I never liked social media. I thought it was the stupidest thing known to humankind. Oh, it, it I, is. I, yeah. All right, guys, I'm sorry I had a break in, but I do got to pay some bills. I got to tell you about our sponsor. We just got one today, so that's good. It's Cuts Clothing. Guys, t-shirts are a menswear staple, but it's long been plagued by horrible conditions such as shrinkage, bacon neck, collar fade, parachute fit. Gotta hate the parachute fit. Those ones that you feel like you're wearing a tent. I find that men don't really know how to wear clothes. It's a, it's a weird thing, but men are not good at fashion, typically. A lot of women are too, but men in particular. Even when they're wearing t-shirts and jeans, they got stuff's too baggy and it's gross. They really don't know what they're doing. And that's where cuts come in, guys. Fabric and function, the only shirt worth wearing, athletically tailored, uh, looks and fits perfectly for work, a date, and everything in between. I have several of their shirts in my closet. I absolutely love them. They have like, there's an elastic feel to them, but they're so soft and comfortable. You guys are absolutely going to love these shirts. That's why Cuts is the only shirt worth wearing, loved by your favorite athletes, entrepreneurs, and even your podcast host, your fearless leader, me. It's been like, uh, it seems like everyone is wearing Cuts these days. Get 15% off your first order by going to CutsClothing.com slash Stapleton. That's CutsClothing.com slash Stapleton for 15% off the only shirt worth wearing. I really like these guys. They have uh, they produce some really high quality, comfortable stuff. Go check them out. Cutsclothing.com slash Stapleton for 15% off. And now we'll get back to the interview. I, I can't stand it. And so I wasn't a social me media darling. I, I, all the people around me were creating their companies using social media. I just did boots to the ground and said, you know what? I'm just going to do interviews. That's what I'm good at. I know my material. No one else wrote it for me. I'm not stealing some other self-help book. You know, this is my stuff. And that's how I built all this. You know, this has been going on for a decade now. So I definitely did it the hard way. But I always say social media. I tell people, you know, that's how I used to find criminals. And when it was great for that, because every moron has a social media account. So if I couldn't find them anywhere else, I would go on Facebook. Or back then, even, it was still MySpace. And I would just go on there. I found every single one on social media, every one of them. And I just go, Ugh. and so, yeah, that's how I, I built everything. And it just, it was getting back away from that stuff. What I had found is what was making me unhappy was following the path I told, I was told would make me happy. Right. Mm -hmm. And I realized, no, it's not making me happy. All, all I've been told is I must go into debt. I have to go to college. I, I, you know, I need to buy a house I can't afford. I need to finance a car I can't afford. You know, get married, pop out a couple kids, and grind out my career until I'm pooping in my diaper and on multiple prescription medications till I die. And I was like, no. I just finally one day I just said, no, no more. I'm not following that. And I just kind of went off in my own little direction. And most of my friends thought I had literally lost my mind. I had multiple friends call me and go, are you all right? Do you need help? Now those same friends are going, what did you do? How did you do it? I want to do what you did. <laughs> and is, <laughs> that, what, is that what caused you to write the book then? Is that you, you, you had some people who were talking to you? This is with the off the, the, off the grid series, right? Is this, is that, 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 that we're at this point as you're making this transition? Yeah, I'd written a couple of short books, health books, and uh, a marketing guy I'd ran into in the health world. He was kind of doing some marketing for me, really bad marketing. And he said, hey, just throw these out on Amazon. They're mainly written for clients. I'd written some short pieces for clients, new, you know, diet, nutrition stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, did that, threw them out. And they, they sold, but they didn't do anything great. They were te terrible covers, brutal, just terrible looking. Um, but that going off the grid book, I, with all the interest, I realized I went, hey, I might want to think about this a little more. So I actually hired a company to do the cover design and layout for me. I had an editor. I found an editor. She had edited my old health stuff. Mm -hmm. And I did this 
crazy thing. You're, you will like this one. Before all that, I wrote this crazy health program. I went and did exercise DVDs, flew out to Georgia, had them filmed on this green screen with me and uh, my ex-girlfriend. And we did, did this whole elaborate thing, and it was this massive three-binder health program. It Still to this day, I'm amazed by it. I had no audience. <laughs> I created a product with no no end user in mind. Oh, dude, that's the story of my life. I'm constantly creating stuff because I think it'll be cool, and I'm like, all right, who could I sell this to? Like, <laughs> I don't, this is this is definitely not something that my current audience would be interested in. So yeah, that stuff happens all the time. I think that's you think it's part of being just a creative person by nature. I don't. I think everybody's got some creativity in them in different ways. Um, but I think for some people who are both inquisitive, I find I find in myself, and it sounds like you're the same that I'm very inquisitive, that I tend to, I say I, I don't have an addictive personality, but I definitely have an obsessive compulsive personality because when I want to learn about a subject, I'll, I'll read eight books on the subject and I will, um, you know, I'll, I'll spend hours watching YouTube videos on it. I got into sacred geometry. I fell down that hole about six months ago and dude, I know so much about sacred geometry now. Um, but I find that I am, I'm constantly doing these deep dives into the weirdest stuff and then out of that sparks some sort of creative, you know, juice that I, I have to like do something with. And do you think that's a do you think that's a trait that you find in a lot of self motivated people like you and me, or is that is that just we're just weird? I don't think so. Uh, for me, I had to learn that my brain works in a little different way and I didn't quite understand it. They thought I had bad ADD as a kid, and what it was is I just was very curious, I think. Uh, I, I don't mm -hmm. think I had necessarily that, but I have a, a very analytical side and a very creative side, which I didn't know was unique. Mm. Uh, I don't think it is. I think it's just the way we've been taught. I think most people have that. It's just been dulled. You're told you're either one or you're the other, but I think we have both sides, the left and right side of the brain, right? Yeah. And so me, the creative side, and trust me, I used to be obsessive compulsive. I fixed it. <laughs> I, I'm still anal retentive, which are two different things. But I've, I've toned it down because I literally was driving myself insane. I couldn't let things go. Like you, if I started learning something, I would stay up till four in the morning for a week straight yeah. and just wear myself out. And I realized probably around, I must have been around 32, 33 I finally said enough, enough of this obsessing. It's you're, you're going to drive yourself into an early grave. And I didn't get actually eight hours of sleep until I was right around probably 35. In my younger years, I did when I had no responsibility. But as an adult, I'd, I'd been living on five hours sleep because my mind never turned off. So I had to kind of reprogram myself a little bit. So I don't go down rabbit holes like I used to. Like I said, I focus on the things that I can change and I ignore the rest. Mm -hmm. It's kind of how I live my life today. And that's where we were talking about the three-legged stool, which I find interesting because you have something very similar. And I think that's because we think alike in, in a sense mm -hmm. that I created the three-legged stool because people were getting a little miffed by my simple life philosophy. Like I didn't realize it would be overwhelming. Well, I so talk to me. Good. Yeah, talk to me about that because I, I've found that the very best teachers – it really oversimplify what what they do and what they think because it is a lot easier for people to wrap their head around and and, and to have an entry point into your thinking. So explain that to everybody because I think it's powerful. Yeah, because what happens is you're so you're so close to it that to you it's it's common sense, right? Because you've been living it, you created it. And it was called, it's called the simple life for God's sakes. I thought, oh, I'm, I'm, and one of my strengths is taking more complex subjects and, and dumbing them down so everyone can understand to include myself. That's how I learned how to do it. That you get lost in the sense that you don't realize that you're so far out there to some people. They get in, they're like, what in the world are you talking about? And you're all, oh God. Okay. And so what it did is it made me come back and go, what are the, three core principles of, and I have the five principles of the simple life, which were part of my health thing. But then I created the three legged stool to take it another step. And it's a two piece, two prong thing to your life that I think you'll like. And this is where a lot of libertarians are, are kind of, it's attracting them to it is optimal health 
is the first leg. Second leg is financial freedom by being debt free. Third leg is life finding your life purpose. So optimal health, I, obviously I'm a health guy. You know, I tell, I tell mm-hmm. everyone, if you don't have your health, life's going to be a struggle in general. And finding, you know, finding financial freedom and finding your life purpose are going to be all that much harder. You know, the elephant in the room in, in the United States today is we are grossly obese and unhealthy. We are number one in the world by far. There's no one even in close competition to us. We are champs at that. And I think it's what's driving a lot of our depression, misery, and people just don't feel good. When you don't feel good, you know what you act like? You act like an asshole. I mean, to Mm. be honest with you, you're not in a good mood. And it takes away your productivity. It interferes with your relationships. It interferes with your work, creativity, sex drive, everything. I mean, everything rolls off of your health. So I always tell people, start there. Start dialing that in. And, and this never ends, right? You talk about this a lot too. This is life. You got to yeah. work on all these till the day you die. Yeah, that's, that's true. Just, you know. Well, let me, everyone let me, wants. Can I can I interject everything. here and just ask a question? See, I I want to I want your opinion on on why you think there is. You know, people are probably as unhappy today, if not more unhappy than than they've ever been. And they they got these studies that talk about it. But I would suggest that we are at least as unhappy as as we were 50 years ago. And yet we have all of these uh, advancements in productivity and we have all these uh, we have all this new technology that that allows us to be closer and, you know, reach out and call somebody on the phone and look at them, the stuff we never had before. And I... It, I, my personal opinion is I think that the reason people continue to be unhappy with their lives and where they're at is because they, they buy into this concept of happily ever after. That at some point when they make enough money or they get they, they buy the house or they get to a certain status in life, that then – things will be perfect and things will be where that things will be good. And then when they show up and they arrive at that point, they realize that it has its own problems and it's not as green as they thought it would be. And then they, they move to the next thing and they get depressed and they get frustrated with it. And my whole thing is just like, listen, you, you don't have to be, you don't have to be um, satisfied with where you are, but be content with what you have now, be happy and find joy in what you have now, because the, the, it's it's silly and such a cliche to say that life is in the journey, but in reality, it is. It's in it's in having um, aspirations and having goals and going after them and and realizing that hey, you're happily ever after is happening right now. And I, I think that I think if we can get to that point, it will help solve some of the unhappiness that we all have. Do you do you agree with that, or do you have a little slightly different take on it? No, I agree. And and you're right. We always hear the cliche. It's like my grandfather used to tell me, do what you love. He always told me that as mm. a kid. And, you know, he was a World War II vet and L.A. fire department chief, retired there. Really good guy. I loved my grandfather. And But he always said that. And I went, ah, Grandpa, whatever. You know, and when, now I'm like, he was 100% right. If you do what you love, you never have to work. Mm. You know? Yeah. Because it is – you know what I mean? And And that's the part – Today is the destination is death. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so why are you focusing on that? You need to focus on the journey. You know, all of us are going to die in the end. And that's kind of what we're chasing in a way, in a roundabout way. We're chasing the carrot. We're looking to the carrot. But once we get to the carrot, then what? The problem is we're too old. We're too broken down. And we're unfulfilled. And that's a big part of what I teach today is, you know, don't force it. And I didn't like all this that happened to me. I didn't force any of this. I mean, once I figured out what was going on, people were interested in it. And I went, Oh, duh, here we go. Now I know what to do. And I agree with you. It's, and not only that, but a lot of things created today in our consumerism economy is chasing shiny objects. I call it widget in widget out. Yeah. Right. All we do is chase widgets. Uh, We make widgets, we work for widgets, we spend widgets, we, you know, and we accumulate more widgets Everything's a widget. And for us to like Silicon Valley is a perfect example of creating products that no one needs. I mean, we don't need them. They don't solve any problems. Yeah. No. Another app doesn't solve my problem. I need things. I need things from people who do things, who are action oriented, who have experience, knowledge and experience. I call it, I call it butt in the seat, time in the salt mines. That's what it's about. And I think today we're just, we're just enamored with shiny objects, you know, uh, in everything. 
And I think that's what's causing a lot of the problems is a lot of people are floating around with no real purpose besides to go to the store and the mall. So how does, Other how than does that, somebody, but how does somebody find that? Cause this is a big problem. I, I have yet to find an answer to this, which is why I, I completely ignore the request from people who say, Jason, I, I get, it. cause I agree with you. I'm, I'm lucky enough in my life to be in excellent health. I, I can use, I'm working on getting rid of this quarantine 15 I got on, but I'm in very good health and, um, in good shape. I am, I'm debt free. I don't carry any debt. And, and I feel like I've found my life's purpose. And if, if that changes tomorrow, then I'll just change. I'll just do something different. But what do you say to the guy who says, you know, I, I, I want to find a, that thing for me. I want to find that thing that I'm, how do I do that? Well, the three-legged stool, you start with your health, uh, clarity, health brings about clarity. And it's funny how health I've done it to a lot of, I've worked with a lot of people over this last decade and I call it watching the lights come on when they finally get the health, that health isn't that complicated. I always say there's no money in healthy people. (laughs) Our whole system is, our health system is geared on you being unhealthy and miserable and staying in the system. Once you remove that, that it now puts the power back on you. And, and we love to just sit around and go, well, it's not my fault. Well, if you're fat and overweight, yeah, actually it is your fault. You're, you're the one who did it. No one's stuffing that donut down your mouth, yeah. you know, down your throat. That's you. That's your choice. If you're not exercising, you're not doing the things you're supposed to be. And people confuse that with exercise and diet as torture. It's the human condition. Uh, we need to eat healthy in order to survive, to thrive. We were programmed for two things. Two things only, survival, reproduction. Everything else is just noise. Well, how do you get there? Uh, You know, obviously that's dumbing it down, but that's what the human species is really geared for. Almost every organism on the planet, that's its two main things that it's pursuing and geared for, all of its DNA. Hmm. So we're fighting that. We're fighting that in a sense that we're eating things we should never eat. We're, you know, I'm reading about Lewis and Clark right now. I'm almost done with the book. It's fascinating how tough these guys were. Holy cow. I mean, getting dysentery and still marching 26 miles. I'm like, what? Wait, huh? These guys are pooping their pants the whole way. Yeah. We can't even get people to walk around the block today, let alone do that. And so, you know, with that three-legged stool, what it does is it it brings everything in focus as far as those are the three things that if you drastically change and you gain control of, your life will be be way different for the better. I mean, way better. And trust me, COVID-19 did nothing to my lifestyle. Made it a little bit of a pain in the butt, little bit. I didn't have any problems getting food. I'm going to tell you right now, there was plenty of grass-fed beef and healthy food, fruits and vegetables. No one was touching those. They were buying Spam, Cheetos, and Coke. So I was good. And toilet paper because they needed the toilet paper for after they bought all those items. I was good. <laughs> I had no problems. And that's how I teach people is that my lifestyle is, is not affected and like you teach because I control it. And those three things in the simple life or in the three-legged stool, well, I tell people too, and this is where it resounds with libertarians, those are the three things we have willingly given away to big government, big business, and big health care. And you, you know what? It's yeah, I, what you said. You said something really powerful, and I want everybody to hear it again because you said you said you spoke specifically about health. You said there's there's no money in being healthy, right? But in the system is yeah. is really set up, and all the money is designed to to keep you unhealthy, and and the the information that you get is designed to keep you unhealthy. But that's really true about every aspect. So if you're financially unhealthy, that's where all the money is. It's in keeping you dependent. It's in keeping you, uh, uh, keeping you, uh, 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 stuck in the job that you're in or forced to work at a job at someplace you don't enjoy with people you don't love. It it causes you at the gym to do things that, uh, to not go to the gym and do all kinds of unhealthy stuff there. If you talk about, um, relationships you know there's no there's no money in good relationships it's only in when your relationships fall apart that now people are standing in line ready to take your money and and keep the machine working so the way that i I, what you're saying is the same thing that i'm trying to preach every day on the show is you know get free get financially independent that starts by paying off your debt get healthy so that you don't have to be in the healthcare system and and you don't have to be sick all the time and uh and you know and then and then get yourself control that income so that you don't have to worry about a job or a boss or anything else find that thing that you're passionate about and uh i just i i just i just want to reiterate because i just i found that to be a really powerful way of looking at 
the system as it exists um, and our place in it. Well, and that's what I mean. What it does is once you kind of get those three honed in, which isn't easy. Everyone, I always tell people, simple doesn't mean easy. It's hard. What I did to get to where I'm at today is hard. It's hard work. Matter of fact, 99.9% .9 of Americans are unwilling to do what I did. Mm. But do they have the capabilities to do it? Absolutely. I am no one special <laughs> by any stretch. I just outgrinded people. That's it. I just stuck my head down and said, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to give up because I failed many times along the way. And, and we, I always tell a lot of my clients, I go, it's not your mistakes and failure that are going to define you as a person. It's how you react to them is going to define you as a person. And I always say, I, I, I am not afraid of failure. I learned from failure. But I just dust myself off, I stop my bitching, and I just get after it. Mm. I just go at it again. I'm thick-headed, and that's what I do. I'm not smarter than anyone else. I'm not more physically gifted. I just outwork, like you talk about, I just outwork everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bottom line, I, I may not be able to beat Elon Musk in, in a, a intelligence test, but I guarantee I can physically outwork him. You know, if it comes down to it, I can dig more holes than Elon Musk. may not help me in life. But, you know... <laughs> You know what I mean? But it's one of those where those three things we've willingly given up. And that's why I talk about how it fits into the libertarian uh, model so much is that once you realize it's a two prong, so you're gaining your own peace of mind, health, well-being, then you're taking about your own personal freedom that you've willingly given away. Mm -hmm. Pretty empowering. When you think about it, as simple as that thing sounds, and even when I, I it actually came to me while I was doing a live speaking event. I, I never, I don't use PowerPoint. I always, all my, I tell people, you can watch all my speaking events and no two will ever be the same. <laughs> I write down, a, in my hotel, I write down like five little bullet points before I go up. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I go, I'm just going to roll with it because I want to see who the crowd is. So I ask them a couple questions to kind of gauge what the demographic is, what they're interested in. And I tailor my, my presentation to them. And what happened was I was sitting there asking questions and all of a sudden that three-legged stool hit me because it was all the pieces that they were interested in. And I went, oh, this is the nuts and bolts of what I teach right here. And then I went home obviously and refined it some more and kind of put the pieces together into my philosophy and what I was trying to say. And that's where it came from. And, I, and that's why, like, uh, I was, I forgot to tell you when we were talking uh, last week that I started listening to you because a friend of mine said, because I was getting more, I left politics. When I got out of the government, I had to turn everything off. I had to say, I'm out. Yeah. No more. Yeah. Don't care. I don't want to hear it. I did it. I got sucked in for like a year and was miserable. And I said, I got to get out of this. He said, hey, you know, you might want to listen to Jason Stapleton. He's a libertarian podcast. I want to say... I listened to maybe, maybe a month or two before you transitioned. And what was interesting was I was about ready to unsubscribe. <laughs> oh, really? I'm the, opposite. I'm the opposite of what you dealt with. I liked your transition. I was a fan. I went, that was good. Because I had pivoted my business, like I told you, six months prior mm -hmm. and did it on a dime. Literally shut everything down. New website, new domain said, it's now the simple life now. It's not a going off the grid health company. It's called The Simple Life. That's what it's about. That's what I'm teaching. And, and when you transitioned, I was like, wow, that was pretty cool. Because it takes guts to do it. I was scared to death when I did it. Were you? Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I, we lost half our audience when, when we did it. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't, it's, it's set, not all of them were, were, were awful, hate filled people, but I just found that one of the things that I, I really discovered was, and one of the reasons it caused me to shift is primarily because I wasn't having an impact on in, in political impact at all. Um, the best I was doing was people were saying, Oh, you know what? I come, I've come around. Like I think the way you do now. And that's like, great. But if you're not taking any positive action in your life, then it doesn't do any good. But more importantly, I'd show up and it's just a bunch of people complaining all day long. And I'm like, dude, I don't want that for my life. There's a, there is enough going on in my life that is stressful I don't need these guys coming in and being a being an additional stress on my life. I want people who empower me, who energize me, and who get me excited about what I'm doing. And I just said, this is the wrong audience. And and yeah, I mean, because you, I mean, my the show at the time at the at the time when we left, the show was doing three hundred grand a year in revenue. And wow. you're like, dude, that's that's a big chunk of change. I could that you know we blow that up. 
Um, it was, it was a huge, huge gamble, but I just knew it was the right thing to do. And I've, I've got this, I got these cheesy little slogans that I use and that I've used in my company for a lot of years. And one of the big ones is doing the right thing is always the right thing to do. Um, if you know, it, just know it's what you're supposed to do, then it shouldn't matter what the cost is. It's the right decision. Um, you know, and so I always try and run my life and my business that way. And I don't always succeed, but, um, that was a big thing. I knew it was the right decision. And regardless of what it cost me, I, I knew I had to do it. Well, it was like with the health world. I was burned out on the health world. You know, I tell people all the time, I go, if you think, and matter of fact, I'm having a guest on my podcast tomorrow to talk about MLMs and natural health. Oh, it's going to be good. Anyone who oh, knows really? my feelings on MLMs. Oh boy. You're not <laughs> a multi-level like, marketing fan? No, not at all. <laughs> okay. Um, no, and I tell people if you think that's that's your goal, and I, the reason I'm doing it too is because people are desperate right now, mm. and I guarantee these MLMs are just foaming at the mouth, just waiting for these people to get them into their funnel and their pyramid scheme because they are pyramid schemes which are illegal. They changed the name to MLM because pyramid scheme is illegal. Um, <laughs> but no, I'm not a fan, and we're going to talk about it. But yeah, it's one of those. I was scared too, but I was just burned out on the health world where there's a lot of MLMs. I have been approached a million times and lit, just scorched the earth with them. And, you know, it was one of those where I said, okay, this is going to be painful. It's going to suck, but I have to do it. I have to do it because the health world was just too toxic. Just I'd had enough. I, I, and not that I don't like teaching it. I just couldn't revolve my whole business around it. It's interesting because say every, that. Why, why, is the, why is the healthcare industry toxic in, in your opinion? Well, it's on both sides too. And I'm an integrative guy. I tell people I don't want a naturopath doing my back surgery on me, just like I don't want my back surgeon telling me how to eat because <laughs> each one of them knows either about the thing, other thing usually. And, and for me, it's just the health world is toxic because again, there's no money in healthy people. Their mm. goal is not to make you better. Their goal is to get you on the, on the train. Once they get you on the train, it's hard to get off. And, and their goal is to keep you relying upon them to think that they're making you feel better when in most cases they're not. You know, our modern medical system is geared towards, you know, it should be geared towards when things go wrong. Not just because you have the sniffles, not because you sprained your ankle. I mean, come on. I sprained my ankle a million times growing up. I never went to the doctor. The last, the only time I went with a sprained ankle was when I dislocated my ankle out of the joint in a basketball game in college. I went, I, and I didn't even go that day. <laughs> I went the next day. Yeah. I even heard it pop out and roll out. And I said, ah, I'll deal with it. And that's the thing is it's just become a place in doing investigations. I saw some awful, horrific things that the medical industry does to include the pharmaceutical industry. I, I mean, just to the point, that's what scared me. Oh, I said, that's why I went into health. Yeah, no. Because I went, I got to tell people this. I was just going to say, the, pharmace the pharmaceutical industry is 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 absolutely um, just an abomination. The, the stuff that they do now, that they legally do, was the stuff that old uh, direct response marketing guys would get thrown in prison for doing. Uh, but because yep. they're the medical industry, because of the pharmaceutical companies, they can do whatever they want to. It's It's absolutely criminal what these guys are doing. But Jason, Kodak's going to solve the COVID-19 problem. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah. They're going to take pictures of people with COVID, I guess. That's what they're going to do. Uh, I mean, it's gotten to the point of such ridiculousness. Mm -hmm. That's why I had to get out. I just And people prey upon each other. And, you know, people would try and crash my website if I piss someone off in the health world. And I just, I just couldn't take it anymore. And only that, but you, you're in L.A. Have you ever been to the Natural Foods Expo in Anaheim? I have not. Oh, you want to see something interesting. Go and see. the They have a natural food, like big. Uh, it's, it's out there, and it's a big floor of it. 90% of the people who own and run the companies are obese and smoke. I mean, it's a disaster. Really? It has nothing to do with health. And that's the problem I had with a lot of it is people were just preying upon other people. And I went, that's not what I'm about. And my health stuff, I tell people. All you got to do is read the book. I have some basic supplements. The reason they're in there, because I used to use them with clients because they'd go out and buy everything they could find from Costco, made in China, wreck their health, and then we had to figure out what they'd done. <laughs> and it always came back to that. 
And I can't get, I've had that supplement line for so long. I can't get rid of it if I wanted to. I'd have so many pissed off customers <laughs> to this day. You'll like this too. I've never had one supplement returned out of thousands and thousands really? of sales. Not one. That's crazy. And it's because I know what the hell I'm doing and I'm not trying to trick anyone. <laughs> yeah. This is the stuff I use and used. That's how I developed it. It had, to, I know what works and what doesn't. And yeah, and that's how, why I had to transition. It was, I just found myself to trying to do better. I ended up in another toxic world. And, and so I went, I got to get out of this natural health world. It's, it's just as scummy as the modern Western medicine world. It's just a different flavor. You know, everyone's trying to rip everyone off. Dude, I feel, I, I, but don't I, you find that's true in just about every industry that you move into? You, I mean, the prepper space would be the same way. I came out of the, uh, the, the you know, the trading and, and uh, financial advisory space, and, and that is just a, just a corrupt institution for most people. I'm in a business, um, I do business consulting now, right? And, and, and of course, that's a corrupt kind of like, there's a bunch of, uh, of, players in that industry that are, aren't operating in good faith. I just think anytime you've got an industry where there's money, you're going to see a lot of disreputable people come out. And I've, I've always rationalized it in my mind, correct or not, and just said, well, listen, I'm one of the good guys. Like I legitimately put together stuff that I think is going to help improve people's lives and change their lives. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure they get maximum benefit out of it. Uh, but I, I, I know that's not true for a large chunk of the people in my industry. I don't know. How do you, I guess my question to you is, is okay, you're bouncing around out of these industries because they're all corrupt. What's going to happen? Are you going to, you're probably going to find the same thing in the self-help space you're in now, right? Oh yeah. Um, well, and that's the thing. You're right. Unfortunately, hum the biggest threat to humanity is humans, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is about us, why we like to just treat each other so poorly and inflict as much misery on each other as we possibly can. I don't understand it. I guess I'm just not wired that way. I have a very guilty conscience. If I, you know, I, I, if I ever lied, even as a kid, I would get so nervous and, oh, I couldn't take it. Just drive myself nuts. And not only that, but being an investigator, uh, especially white collar crimes, it, it, these people you wouldn't even know were criminals. Uh, they, they're in your, neighborhood you know they're not peddling drugs out the back door or anything they own just criminal enterprises that are shrouded in business mm. well i found investigating them that most of them had no very close friends even though they had a lot of money a lot of their friends were business associates and i used to read all their emails because i'd get them in search warrants and i'd get all their documents these people were screwing each other over left and right looking over their shoulder had all kinds of substance abuse issues and i went you know what it's better just to do it the right way. <laughs> you know, I don't have to look over my shoulder. I'm not trying to trick anyone. And what it did for me, I think is, I'll take, Matt will love this. I took a page from, from Rush. I said, I'm just going to dig it. I'm just going to draw my line. I'm going to do it my own way. Hell or high, if I, I'll fall on my sword. If I screw this up and it blows up in my face, fine. I'll deal with it. It's my fault. So the whole thing with the simple life and the direction I'm going and the way I've built everything is I'm just doing it my way. And anyone who reads my books, I said that I will write my books my way. I've read enough self-help books. I don't read a ton uh, anymore, but they all sound like the same thing with the same backstory, same page count. It's the same crap over and over and over again by people who have never done any of it. And I just said, I'm done with that. So I write my own style. Not terrible. Like I said, I wasn't an English major, mm -hmm. but I do a decent job and it's more about the information and understanding the path. And that's why I've made sure that integrity was in the habits book, that that people understood. This isn't just to, you know, get some quick tricks to make some more money, make yourself better. It's about living a better life and be, living it with integrity. That's what you need to do. And that's what we all should be doing. We should be living in Nirvana. We have screwed this experiment up to... <laughs> I can't even believe it. I, I just, every day I'm, I'm dumbfounded. It keeps getting worse. The fact that people think it's okay to burn other people's stuff and belongings and no one blinks an eye anymore. Yeah. We become conditioned to it. I mean, I live in a part of the country. I, I've heard you talk about this. 
And I laugh because we have that similar background. Uh, a couple, uh, a little group of Antifa people tried rolling through here from the west side of Washington, and they thought they were going to stir some stuff up in my little town on their way to another bigger town in Idaho. I'll just put it this way. It didn't go real well for them because they soon realized we're not going to put up with that. Yeah. And like you've said, my people, my friends, we're highly trained and we're highly lethal, but we're really nice people. And we, we, we use a lot of restraint in our lives. I've always said, just, just wait till the people who just want to be left alone start getting involved because you're going to push one of the, you're, you're going to push some people to their backs against the wall and they're not going to sit around and they're, they're going to fight and they're going to, and they know how, you know, they, they're good at hurting people. Um, they just don't do it very much. And so it's, it's, I, I got a feeling if this continues, it's, they're just going to hit a tipping point like that. And you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, they, they don't, there's a certain doors that you don't want to knock on and mine would be one of them. Cause, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I just laugh. It makes me angry. I don't know if it makes you angry. I actually sent my, I have a friend of mine. He sent me some stuff this morning on Twitter and I just, it was all the, the writing that was going on. I just sent him back and I'm just like, you know, I, I said, I'm tired of all the hate. I'm just, I'm tired of all of it. The, the fact that we just can't respect each other and, and, and do our best to support each other is, is just criminal. What these people are doing is terroristic by definition. And the fact that the very people that we've entrusted our security to do nothing is all the more reason for us to do exactly what you're talking about today, which is to take ownership of those three legs of your life and and to start looking at you know creating that that true freedom in in um in your world so that you don't so you aren't subject to this type of tyranny well and with your your nomadic wealth formula right and i preach the same thing and in a similar i say i can leave yeah. if this goes to crap wherever matt i just pack my stuff up and i go you know i've lived in a tra you know i grew up in a trailer grew up poor i've lived in an rv for almost a decade now i still live in the thing part of the year. I'm just getting ready to build another place in another part of the country, which will be undisclosed. Um, I gave this area out way too much and caused myself some issues, but not bad. <laughs> just some people have gotten a little close. Oh, wow. But, um, no, well, no, just fly. Multiple people have flown over and they say, hey, man, I flew over your place. Looks pretty cool. And I'm like, oh, geez. Okay, thanks. Um, that's not uncomfortable. No, not and they didn't all. mean it. They didn't mean anything bad by it. They're, I'm real lucky. Like you, my, m the people who read my books and follow me and listen to my podcast are some of the most fantastic people in the world. And that's one thing about building the business the way I did. And I'm sure you have the same experience. Yeah, I may not have the darling massive audience like some people, but I also people aren't bugging me because they're out. I always say they're not on Facebook, you know, putting pictures up to their cat. They're going out there and making it happen mm -hmm. because my books put the onus on them. I tell people, I go, you shouldn't even have to ask me questions. It's all there for you. The only thing missing is you getting off your butt and doing it. That's the only thing missing. So and let's, so well, let's, I let's close it out that way then. And what, let's take, so let's say, but well, we're going to have a lot of people who listen to the show today and they're like, dude, I'm, I'm buying what he's laying down. I'm, I'm drinking that Kool-Aid, but I don't know if I'm ready to sell all my stuff and move to a cabin in the woods. What, for somebody who wants to take advantage and start doing this, what you call this lifestyle reboot, what do you think, what's, so, do you have some tools, some resources for them, some things that they can do to kind of start learning more about it? Absolutely. And that's what I learned too, is I got so far ahead of myself as writing this series because I didn't plan it out and like, uh, you know, I didn't have this, this massive business model and I'm going to do this and I'm going to dominate. It's just, I let it evolve. I tried to figure out, it started from what, what would I have wanted 30 years ago to help my life? What was the material I would have needed and wanted? Mm -hmm. That's where all this began from. Well, so that this whole thing's an experiment. Because also I'm trying to figure out how people are going to react and how they're going to learn. What are the, you know, I, I was a college professor for a while, so I'm good at teaching things, but that doesn't mean you're perfect. You never know what someone needs until it takes a while. You have to kind of figure it out. And that's why you're always experimenting. But I wrote a very simple starter book after I'd written five of the simple life books or four of them. And the fifth was almost out. It's called Life Balance Reboot, The Simple Life. And what I did with that is it's like 65 pages and it just gives you the basics. It says, this is the principles of what I teach. This is how you get started. 
this is why. This is the how and the why and how. And I feel that most people want to take big chunks. And I'm getting ready to release a journal. And people wonder how I do this. Well, because I don't focus on stupid stuff. I get stuff done. But I just created a journal for 365 days. And it's a different journal. It's not that typical crappy journal that you just fill out, go back. and No, no, no. Mm-hmm. There's action steps for 365 days. You got to do something every single day. And it's building you know, those positive habits a little chunk at a time. And if you do that for a year, you're going to have massive growth, massive change. I did an experiment last year. I should have done it this year. I, uh, I've spent five years building my house. People who don't understand, there's no money. Uh, there's no financing for living off the grid. You have to pay cash. Now that it's changing, I found a couple banks that are doing some of it, but it's 50% down, high interest. So it's getting better. But basically, you got to grit, grind this stuff out. Well, I put the business on the back burner. So I said, okay, for year last year, 2019, I said, I'm going to work for a year straight. No vacations, no screwing around. I'm going to work every single day. Mm. And the only rule was if I started to burn out or if I felt that, you know, I was, it was making me unhappy or, you know, unfulfilled, I would stop. Well, I made it through. It was a little bit of a grind at the end. Made it through. But what it did, what it taught me is, gosh, if you just dedicate a year, holy cow, I got more done in that year than I'd ever gotten done at any stage of my life. I was like, wow, that was amazing. So it's, that's what I would tell people, start there. And then I have a book called Decluttering Your Life, which is kind of a lot of pieces of things that are getting us off track is what that book's about. And what I teach, and I, and I know, uh, Because you live in LA, I live in the Mm -hmm. sticks, right? And people think, well, how's living? I don't want to live in in, in the woods on on 50 acres or whatever. No, no, no. Everything I do is geared. I have a lot of people who've read Going Off the Grid who have no intention of ever living off the grid. It's about the journey, the lessons, and the information I put in there. This can be done, the three-legged stools for anyone living anywhere, period. I did not make it just for people who want to live remote and out in the sticks and take it. What I, I call it a la carte, right? I'm, I'm serving it to you as much as far as you want to take it. If you want to, your end result is you want to live off the grid or live in an RV and, and live around the country running your business, hey, I can take you there. If you just want to simplify your life living in LA, got that for you too. Yeah, I love it, all the print. I just, I, I love it. I love the philosophy. I love the way you think. I love the way you've kind of directed your life. Mark was right. It was, um, I'm glad that he introduced us because I, yeah, I think that what you're doing is powerful. Um, and for all of you who are interested, the website is the simple life now.com. It'll be in the show notes. You guys can check it out there. Um, and, uh, Gary, thanks so much, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing with, uh, with everybody here. And, uh, we'll, we'll gotta have you back on, man. The next time you do something big, we'll just have you back on to talk about it i really appreciate it jason yeah we've been running in the same circles for a while now so it's good to finally finally meet you yeah excellent all right guys that's gonna do it for today go out there have some fun we'll be back here on wednesday to do it all over again until then be safe be good i'll talk to you then if you enjoyed today's show do me a favor subscribe and then share it with a friend and if you're ready to take the next step towards controlling your life income and future then i'd like to help Just go to controlthesource.com to get started.